I thank you all. You've really put a lot of effort in engaging with each other, in participating in the discussions in this room, the speakers who have spoken. I think you've uh, really got the right vibe going. I want 24 hours more of your life. <laughs> and then I'll come back again, but 24 hours more at this time. One day at a time, as someone said. Okay, so that's the first point. That Thank you so much. The second. We are, over the next one year, as a foundation and with our partners, uh, going to be creating similar conversations in different parts of the world. I can confirm that uh, a few of them are New York, Cape Town, Abu Dhabi, and India, in Delhi, and uh, then eventually in, in some parts in Europe. Um, and we would like uh, all of you who want to and wish to speak, contribute, write, as we carve these and craft these um, touch points, please reach out to us, to me, to my colleagues. Uh, I think I would have bombarded your inboxes already, so I should be uh, in your drop-down list. Um, send me a mail, send me an idea, send me themes, send me the conversations you think should be happening, send me the countries we've missed out on, send me some experts that we need to include. Uh, we want your inputs to make this more inclusive, more wholesome, uh, and certainly uh, uh, more contemporary. Um, and uh, uh, please don't hesitate to send us your criticism as well. Uh, we are but a community that is going to uh, be together as we navigate these uh, interesting times. Okay, so that's the mansplaining. Now, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome uh, the panel uh, this evening, uh, moderated by uh, the curator of this dialogue and someone who was there at the very beginning, uh, the founder of uh, this uh, initiative, uh, Terry Chapman. Terry, can I uh, invite you on stage? She's going to be moderating this conversation. Let me invite uh, my very dear friend and very esteemed friend, uh, Suzanne Malkora, who you've heard earlier, and she uh, represents an organization that is seeking uh, to, uh, uh, to, to incubate women leadership around the world. And Susan, thank you so much for making the trip. Uh, let me invite Elizabeth Laruni, who's uh, going to give us a little bit of a British perspective. And of course, uh, it would be uh, um, amiss uh, not to um, introduce the next uh, speaker, Vlada Galan, as uh, the woman who wore the Ukraine flag during Lavrov's panel at the Raisina Dialogue. <laughs> so, so, Vlada Galan. But uh, the, moti the motivation and the inspiration for this conversation happens to be the final speaker, uh, Christina Lunds. Christina has been writing on this, has been evangelizing this, has been battling for this. And I have battled very hard to get her here. So, Christina, thank you for joining us this time around. And do come back to other events as well. So, with that, Terry. Um, uh, oh, oh, sorry. Peter. Where is the token man? <laughs> Peter Kirk. Uh, Peter, by the way. Okay, listen. Um, all of you who want to go to the most beautiful conference ever hosted must talk to Peter and force him to invite you to the Bled Forum. It's on the most gorgeous lake with the best surroundings, and Peter's hospitality is absolutely uh, unmatched. Peter, thank you for being the token man on this panel. Terry, let's start. Well, I kind of wanted to start by getting a little bit of a sense from the room. So raise your glass if you identify as a feminist. So let's see. OK. Now, raise your glass if you call yourself a feminist, but you aren't really sure what that means. Anyone? I see a few. OK, well, tonight we're talking about feminism and foreign policy. So I am, we have, we've already had our introductions, but we have a star panel tonight, and I'm super excited. So let's just dive in. Um, Feminist foreign policy is not a new idea. It's not new, but it's gained a lot of traction recently. I think now we have something like 11 countries who have implemented or stated their intention to implement a feminist foreign policy, and it's a diversity of countries from Mexico to uh, Chile to France to Germany. Um, and I would like to argue that this has gained traction because the entire project for providing human security has been co-opted by a militarization agenda and men's experiences. 
And the project for ensuring human security and welfare has fallen prey to patriarchal international systems that serve very few. And to that, that is to the detriment of all of us. So I think it's important to start out by thinking about what we're talking about. What is feminist foreign policy? I'm gonna put forward three things that I think are important, but I'm sure my panelists are going to have some of their own inputs on that. So three things that I think are critical for feminist foreign policy. Uh, one, it's not about women and girls. Let's not be mistaken. It's about intersectional, marginal groups. It's about race, it's about gender, it's about uh, immigration status. So this is not a conversation about women and girls. Second, feminist foreign policy is about more than gender equity and foreign assistance. It is about uh, including a feminist lens and framework in trade, in defense, in diplomacy, in aid, in climate, and immigration. So we're not just talking about bringing a feminist lens to foreign assistance and aid. And third, I would say that a truly feminist foreign policy has to be underpinned by a domestic agenda that supports it. So I think I'm gonna give a little bit more context. Why should we care about feminist foreign policy? It's a project, an objective in and of itself, but it also aligns with other important projects. And when women and girls and other marginalized groups are given access, when they're given resources and decision-making and power, we're all better off and we're all more secure. Militarization does not equal security necessarily, but equity does. So for example, research shows that societies with greater gender equity overall are more stable, they're less likely to, they're less prone to violent conflict. Research also shows the countries with a greater share of women's economic participation experience less international conflict. In fact, societies with a female labor force participation rate of 40% are 30% less likely to be involved in international conflict than countries with a female labor force participation rate of 10%. And finally, when women are involved in peace negotiations, they're more likely to work. In fact, when women are a part of that process, they're 15% more likely to last for two years, and they're 35% more likely to last for 15 years. So in other words, when societies are more equal, when women and other marginalized groups are represented, when they're economically, socially, and politically empowered and have access to and control over resources, and when they're part of the process in a meaningful way, we all benefit. So in my view, feminist foreign policy must disrupt embedded patriarchal power structures that lead to unequal access to exercise of rights, resources, and opportunities. But I'm first now going to turn it to Christina. Could you share with us what your view of a feminist foreign policy looks like? Maybe you can highlight a few things from Germany and some of the bright spots that Germany might offer for other countries. Um. I cannot remember the last time I was on a, on a panel on feminist foreign policy where the introduction was so beautiful. Usually, the things you. you have just said, I would have to explain that it's not about only girls and women, that it's not only about like having more female ambassadors around the world. So um, I'm smiling, I'm very happy. Thank you for that, that is amazing. Um, so as you rightly said, feminist foreign policy is not a new idea. Um, it's at least more than 100 years old during the First World War. In The Hague, more than 1,200 feminists came together to not only demand the end of the World War, but also um, they uh, um, visualized um, a new world order and wrote 20 resolutions. Um, they included, that was before the founding of the League of Nations, um, that included an international um, court for arbitration. It included the dismantling of the military-industrial complex. It included um, women's suffrage around the world. It included mediation as a key instrument for conflict resolution. Um, it included an end to the colonial imperial project. Um, it, because you also rightly mentioned that, of course, um, feminism as a movement has always understood that the patriarchal world or the patriarchy is the societal order we all of us live in for the past four thousand six, four to four to six thousand years, and um, the patriarchal oppression um, towards women is closely linked to the racist oppression um, and the colonial project. 
So um, feminism has always, for the past 200, 250 years, tried to dismantle um, patriarchy, to shift power, to shift power away from men, um, because in our society, historically, men have been holding power, resources, access to positions. And the Caribbean represented itself in the global fora. We were part, fundamental part, I would say, of the foundation of the United Nations. 50 nations were part of that. 15 of those came from our region. So clearly, there is a, a basic understanding of the common goods that in the region is, is well, has been well recognized for a long time. As per the specifics, it's clear that uh, there are a few countries that have already embraced the notion of coming forward with feminist foreign policy. Argentina announced back in March the appointment of a special representative for feminist foreign policy, which is a first step to, to move in that direction. I always like to recall my good friend and colleague Margot Wallström, who, as you might all know, was the foreign minister of Sweden when they, they enacted feminist foreign policy. And she says that what is critical is to understand that feminist foreign policy is about rights, representation, and resources. And we hear today a lot of conversations about resources coming from different angles. Here again is where reality becomes true, is whether the countries, the governments that are betting on feminist foreign policy align that foreign policy with the internal policies as you described, Terry, and on top of that, they put the money where their mouth is. To me, that is one of the biggest challenges that we face today. It, not only that this becomes a trend because it's fashionable, but because we really bet on it and we invest through the different means that countries have through their foreign policy of investment, big countries, small countries, donor countries, recipient countries, always keeping in mind that there has to be a feminist lens indicators to assess impact. So those are the things that I believe will make a difference moving forward. Thank you. And that links really well to my next question, which is, I'm going to turn to you, Elizabeth. We see the rights of women being rolled back in lots of different countries. How do you think that is going to shape the possibility of truly feminist foreign policy? And what, what's the context, basically? Can we think about a feminist foreign policy? Um, and how does what we're seeing in many countries, including the US and many others, how does that kind of shape what we can hope for? Um, I suppose it's ironic that as more and more countries are adopting a feminist foreign policy, at the same time, you're seeing a rollback of, of um, hard-won rights, particularly for women's rights organisations. Um, so I think definitely it's positive, but the issue has always been the implementation. Um, I work for a peace-building organisation, and for those that don't know what peace-building is, it's really looking at root causes of conflict, the drivers of conflict, and gender inequality being one of them. So for, um, and we get a lot of our money to do our programming from governments, particularly Western governments. So, you know, it makes us happy when a Western government that gives us money adopts a feminist foreign policy, because that's the kind of work that we've been doing in terms of taking a gender transformative approach, which fits in very well with our feminist, fo feminist foreign policy tenants. So it's good, but um, you are seeing cuts in budgets to spending on gender, um, and this is directly impacting women's rights organisations that only receive 1% of um, overseas development aid to do their work, and even less of that goes to local and national organisations that are working on advancing women's rights and gender equality. Um, and this, this started happening um, way before, I think you can see it with measures in terms of um, the COVID pandemic, the militarization of implementing that and the impact that had particularly on women, freedom of movements, women's voices, um, being stifled, particularly in the online sphere, attacks on women's rights organizations and defenders. Um, so this, this 
to me seems a very specific attack on advancing feminist foreign policy and gender equality. Um, so I think what to watch out for for countries that are adopting a feminist foreign policy is accountability in terms of do they have the budgeting um, to be able to implement their policies? Are they following through? Are they inclusive in who they're working with? Women's rights organizations, consultations um, with the right people um, and a diversity of voices that will shape those policies. I think that's the only way we'll move away from rhetoric and actually see it in reality. Yeah, and I think that's one of the key issues, right, is it might be fashionable, as you mentioned, to implement a feminist foreign policy. I mean, we can all call ourselves feminists, but it's really what, we're, what we do with that. And there's obviously a, a kind of scale in terms of the real sort of um, depth of feminism and the feminist approach that different feminist foreign policies are taking. Um, I want to turn it to Vlada now. Vlada, how in other ways are domestic policies and domestic political environments sort of shaping the potential of feminist foreign policies in countries that have not yet kind of taken this approach? So I think that depends where you find yourself in the world. And often um, feminism, activism, feminist foreign policy is tied to a party. It's not like that in every single country, but in the United States, that's typically a left-wing issue um, that's progressively, in my opinion, becoming um, more radical as we get into issues of transgender and many other things that I think we can discuss uh, further on. But uh, Susanna mentioned the three R's in feminist foreign policy, rights, uh, resources, and representation. And I think those are all things and objectives that we can all get behind, and I think everyone in this room would say that they agree with that. But I, I would like to play devil's advocate here a bit. Um, and the fact is that advocates of feminist foreign policy um, cannot find often a consensus on what that actually means. And, and that's a problem. Um, feminism in Nairobi, Kigali, uh, Kampala means something very different than it does perhaps in San Francisco. And um, there's, this poses kind of a lot of questions. Um, are people who support feminist foreign policy promoters of peace at any cost? I mean, this is a question that is raised. While throwing national security out the window, um, one of the tenets of feminist foreign policy is less on defense budget and more on human rights and on um, social projects. So does feminist foreign policy mean that a female defense minister, for example, who advocates for a larger defense budget go against feminist foreign policy? This raises lots of questions. Um, at the basis, though, um, is how you define universal feminism for feminist foreign policy. And that would satisfy feminism in places like Nairobi, Kigali, as well as San Francisco. Having women in armed forces and women in military leaderships is technically supported by feminist foreign policy. Um, but then increasing spending uh, in defense budget goes against um, feminist foreign policy. This is a bit of a paradox and, and, and kind of a bit of an issue. Um, one country's domestic policies on feminism do not necessarily fit in with feminist foreign policies. And that's because no one can define the parameters of feminist foreign policies since it means so many different things to different people. And I think this becomes a bit of a challenge. And um, I think Susanna earlier mentioned this, the Sweden model. Um, it's one of the oldest, most comprehensive models of feminist foreign policy concept. Um, Canada, France, Luxembourg, Spain, Germany have kind of adopted some versions based off of that. Um, but Sweden has a lack of horizontal coherence between its feminist foreign policy and its arms export policy. Sweden continues to supply arms to regimes that violate human rights and women's rights. Um, for example, arms are sold uh, from Sweden to Saudi Arabia that are used in Yemen. So this is a criticism. And um, it, feminist, feminist foreign policy, in short, can easily be criticized um, as an imposition of Western norms uh, whose basis is in, in, in liberal feminism, which fails uh, to do justice to the diversity of cultural continents. And I, I think that I'll leave it there. Yeah, and I think you bring up a lot of common criticisms and a lot of important questions about feminist foreign policy. Um, 
I would say that I don't think that we all need to necessarily agree on every aspect of what feminist foreign policy is. I think there can be different frameworks in different contexts, but I'm sure other, other speakers will have um, different perspectives on that. But I first want to turn it to Peter. Peter, I think there's a lot of points of intersection between feminist foreign policy and our climate, our need to address climate change. Can you talk about that intersection and, um, and how you think they might align and where the key points of contention might be? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Terry. Uh, thanks for having me here on the, on the panel. Actually, Terry asked me before the panel if uh, I'm afraid being uh, on this kind of panel, only men, and uh, discussing feministic foreign policy. And I say, you know, at the end of the day, uh, at this time and age, if you are afraid of uh, women power, you are basically living in a past. You are living in a past. Uh, the shame is, the problem is that those who are still living in the past somehow uh, still try to co-create our future. And I think uh, this is a problem that we need to tackle. This is a problem that we need to kind of address. Uh, Getting back to Vlada, basically what f feministic foreign policy means for me, it's about inclusivity. It's about inclusivity. It's about you know, putting to work half of uh, global brain, ideas, suggestions, and if you don't do that, for me as a man living in the 21st uh, century, this is basically stupid, totally stupid. Because, uh, you know, and with this, I'm coming to actually uh, the intersection between climate and feministic foreign policy. Uh, in a sense, uh, and of course, you know, talking about climate and feministic foreign policy, you know, Greta Thunberg is a woman, is a girl. Uh, she's a symbol, but she's also a symbol of how women perceive um, climate change. I think the approach and also you know how uh, they uh, tackle this problem is much more holistic and we need this holism in order to um, address this challenge and this is why I was talking about inclusivity because if you don't have inclusivity and all the other aspects that feministic foreign policy is introducing into foreign relations for example solidarity human rights uh, vulnerable groups uh, gender equality and all these things, then you can't successfully fight climate change. It's impossible. And I think also women, <clears throat> if you look globally, they understand uh, or the impact of climate change is uh, by some data impacting 20% more women than men, especially in the developing uh, countries. Uh, so, uh, Introducing the concept of feministic foreign policy into the discussion on climate change is basically necessary. I mean, if we don't have inclusivity, solidarity, human rights in these things, we are not going to be successful in uh, fighting cl climate change because at the end of the day, you know, we are all in the same boat. It's not like we are going to have a planet for men and a planet, planet for women and in one planet we are going to drive electric cars and in the other we are going to drive diesel. So uh, this is why I think this concept uh, is so important, you know, so important and I think that uh, introducing it uh, all over the world is a prerequisite on not just fighting uh, climate change but all the other things that we were discussing here, peace building, uh, uh, social inclusivity and so on and so on. Yeah, and the reason that I bring up climate change specifically is because I think, you know, women are disproportionately and differently affected by climate change. We know that. And uh, climate change is a major part of countries' external action and their foreign policy, and those two certainly intersect. Um, Christina, I feel like you've probably heard all of the criticisms of feminist foreign policy. Which ones are the ones that you feel like you need to sort of um, rebuke here? Let me focus on two of them briefly. Um, and um, the questions that you mentioned before, um, that's totally fine to have all these questions because feminist foreign policy, it's, it's nothing less than a concept and a movement 
um, for transformation. And it's a complex under undertaking for a complex world. So the responses cannot be simple. So it's totally fine to have these questions and um, to be asking them. Um, first of all, um, it, it is true in feminism, such as <laughs> in, in countries tackling or focusing on climate justice, in like countries and movements focusing on human rights, and, and movements focusing on feminism, there's never in any of them a complete agreement on what we should exactly prioritize in none of them. And that's totally fine because different people have different lived experiences. And um, some people argue for the right to water to be a human right. Others are, there are like so many different aspects in all these movements. So it's the same for feminism. It does not have, not everyone has to agree on everything. And it's definitely not a counter argument against the movement. Um, and the, the point about it being a Western concept, um, that's an interesting one. Um, I think it's a funny one if we, if we look at history, at world history, it, it does not make sense, um, the, um, that, that criticism. And that is because we have feminist movements um, innate to almost all countries in the world, civil societies everywhere. In fact, um, the... Uh, the fact that we have equal rights for men and women in the UN Charter, we owe that to Berta Luz from Brazil and to uh, Minerva Bernardino from the Dominican Republic, mm -hmm. who at the founding of the UN made sure that it also has this feminist aspect in there. Um, if so, at my organization, the Center for Feminist Foreign Policy, we're working with an impressive advisory council with feminists from all over the world, and recently I asked Rosebel Kagomira, she's um, an, an African feminist. I said to her, Rosebel, people keep coming to us and saying it's such a Western concept. And she said to me, oh, Christina, that is that in itself, it's just so unfair. And, and, and somehow, um, in a way, she said it's, it's racist because it makes the point that the, 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 the work that we as women on the African feminist, on the African movement, the work we have done, it doesn't count for anything or the history is completely being erased. And the history of the feminist movement on the African move, uh, continent, she said, has been so closely linked to the decolonized um, movement. And also during the UN decade for women, 1975 to, um, to 85, for example, it's been Global South feminists who have been driving the conversations on feminism and linking them to classism and anti-racism when women from the, or feminists from the Global North too often were focusing on representation only. Um, and especially now, if we look in Afghanistan, at Iran, <laughs> it's f it, like the Iranian um, um, revolution. It's a feminist undertaking. So. The, that criticism, um, it, it simply does, does not um, make sense. And maybe uh, another one about the, the um, which I've been uh, approached with or a lot um, over the past year um, since the, the Russian war against Ukraine has started. People kept saying, um, so it does, mean, does it mean feminism with its focus on demilitarization that you cannot deliver weapons to Ukraine, but the people need support. And I always said, like we, my organization, we always said, of course it doesn't mean that. Feminism has always meant, of course, defending the right to self-defense. If a woman is walking home at night alone and she's attacked, of course she needs to self-defense. And the same is true for people being attacked um, by, um, by, by another country. So. But, but feminism or feminist foreign policy, what it does is it distinguishes between short, medium, and long term. So in the short term, the status quo of the world is a hyper-militarized status, where we have um, nine nuclear powers, and, and, it, and, and a fact of that is that we have um, mass murderers in possession, like, like Putin, in possession of nuclear weapons. And if that is a fact, of course, weapons in the short term need to be sent to Ukraine, but at the very same time, and that is the difference compared to current foreign policy from Germany and feminist foreign policy, is at the very same time as weapons are being delivered, we already, already need to think about what are we doing in the long term so that we come to a point as a society where the hyper-militarized state of the world is no longer in existence, and how can we support movements such as the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons and other organizations who've been working on creating a nuclear-free world? That's the difference, the differentiation between short, medium, and long term. Absolutely, and I think 
perhaps we'll return to that, the difference between the immediate need for security for women and others um, and longer term objectives of feminist foreign policy. But first, Excellency, you've served as foreign minister. Can you give us some insights into the realities on the ground and the opportunities and the barriers to actually realizing a feminist foreign policy? Well, I serve as foreign minister and I was chief of staff of Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. So I can give you the perspective from the country, but also the perspective from the United Nations. And I will argue that we are living in, in, in a moment which has taken root in the past few years of pushback on women's rights. We are losing ground overall in the world. So that is what you need to face when you think about a policy that is centered on women. There is an unholy coalition of conservative minds that want to retain power and push back on many of the rights that have been achieved. And we see that in the US, we see that in countries, countries in Europe, we see it in the global south too. So this is what we are facing, this is the challenge. When you look at the stock taking for Agenda 2030, you know this year is the midpoint review for Agenda 2030. There is a report that came only recently that shows that every single indicator has lost ground, every single one, particularly SDG 5, which is women's rights, but also on climate change, on poverty, on the indicators that really tackle the issues that affect women is where we lost more ground. And let's not fool ourselves. This is not only a problem of COVID. This is not only a problem of the Ukraine war and, and food prices and oil prices. This is a more fundamental challenge that we are facing. So as a foreign minister or as, or as chief of staff of the Secretary General, what we see and what I have seen is a trend to deconstruct many of the achievements that have been obtained after Beijing, I would say. And this is what a foreign policy, a feminist foreign policy needs to tackle and needs to tackle in a way that permeates across all areas and gets us to a place where the world is more just for all. Can't agree more. Um, yeah, I mean, I think in a lot of ways we blame the rollback of women's rights on COVID and that's not acceptable because some of that is true, but that does not explain all of it. And I think we have to be cognizant of that. Um, I do want to open it up for questions, so please prepare your questions. Think about what you want to ask. In the meantime, Vlada, I wanted to bring it back to you. Um, do you think there's anything that a feminist foreign policy has to offer? Are you, do you see any pieces of that agenda or that kind of framework or this sort of concept that is useful? Well, um, I'll say that even narrow national versions of feminist foreign policy um, can strengthen uh, the multilateral normative framework um, by internalizing its norms. But I think that unless we have a definition of what we define feminism and, and, and come up with some sort of more or less loose consensus, we find ourselves, um, I think, in quite a bit of trouble. I think this becomes a very slippery slope and uh, feminist foreign policy um, becomes like Pandora's box. I mean, an inclusive understanding of, of feminism also embraces further identities, um, such as LGBTQIA, I might be missing a few. Um, I mean, if you look at, look at um, notable feminists, um, one that comes to mind, an example that I thought of um, before I came on the panel was um, Martina uh, Navratilova. And she's one of the most famous female tennis players um, in the world. She's a lesbian and a feminist. And she has recently been incredibly um, against and vocal um, uh, trans athletes participating in women's sports. Um, she has been the face of gay rights and feminism over the last, I would say, 30 years. And, um, and so what do supporters of feminist foreign policy say about transgender athletes in terms of national policy? But, you know, we talked about 
you know, these are not issues that you see a lot, particularly on the African continent. This is not a question that we're having here. We don't have a lot of biological males competing in women's sports. I mean, these are things that come up. So I think we have to kind of set some definitions in and ask um, some of the, I think, harder questions. Okay, so I want to see if anyone has any questions from the audience. Um, Usta, I see you there. Does any, is there a mic that we can get here? Okay, <laughs> thanks. No, no, feminist foreign policy is going to rule us. <laughs> I have to. <laughs> thank you, now I think the mic is a moving one. Well, thank you for um, the panelists and Maybe, uh, I think it's gonna be for me different, but don't you think that already foreign policy, especially from the south part of it, has been a big, has faced a lot of big critics, you know? And feminism itself, if you look at the different levels of feminism, the understanding and the argument is extremely wide. You know, you will have black feminists, you will have fem contemporary feminism, you will have all the categories of feminism. Two and a half years of my PhD was trying to understand feminism. I don't know if I did or not. So my <laughs> question is, if we really want to impact lives, what did we need to do better in terms of feminism as a policy, but also co co combining it with one of the most challenging part which is foreign policy with all the wounds that it comes with. Are we going to achieve more and impact more? Or is there anything that we really we need to de-feminize, decolonize in the name of itself? Because there is also, you, you're getting two terms that have a very uh, attacked approach and putting them together. What do we want as a best takeaway in this discussion? Thank you. Thank you, Usta. Did you want to respond to that one? Can I say something? Yes, yeah. please. We had a brief conversation prior to the panel, and I precisely introduced that notion. I think what, what we need to agree on is what are the principles that drive this notion of embedding in the foreign policy a perspective that has women's rights at the center, that has a demilitarization view. I wouldn't myself, some might disagree, push for calling it feminist foreign policy in every single case. There might be places where you can push that without putting that label to it. And, you know, references were made that you need to take into account the uniqueness of each place. So for me, what is fundamental is that we mainstream the notion of a different model for the world. And that you have that embedded in your in national policies, but you also have that embedded in the way you relate to the world, which is through your foreign policy, through your trade policies, through the many lens, lenses that connect you with the world. That, to me, is the fundamental question. There might be places where Putting those two names together is a step too far, and you know I will recognize that. Peter, I think you had a comment. Yeah, <clears throat> I think we shouldn't mix uh, feministic foreign policy with uh, the notions of uh, what, it, what is right and what is wrong. You know, uh, when Vada was talking about you know how can a defense minister, which is a woman. Uh, you know, support uh, sending guns to wherever, you know, if, you know, feministic foreign policy is about dem demitalization and all these things. I was on a panel somewhere in um, Germany, I think, and there was one lady from the Green Party, uh, German Green Party, which was in the parliament, and they asked her, how could you support sending weapons to Ukraine? You being from the Green Party, you being a woman, you being a supporter of feministic foreign policy. And she said, uh, you know, it was a tough decision for me. I couldn't sleep for a few days uh, because, yes, it goes against all my instincts, all my principles. But, you know, I understand what is right and what is wrong. And uh, when it comes to tough political or security decisions, 
It doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman, you take the right decision. Uh, so I think, you know, this notion that women cannot be uh, good defense ministers or they can't, you know, I think we all understand what is being right and what is being wrong. Can I just jump in here for a second? I don't see what we, okay, there you are. Can I just jump in here for yes, a second? Yes, please. I think, you know, it wasn't the question of can women be good defense ministers or not. Women can do just about anything they put their minds to. Um, but I, I think this goes um, to the tenant, just to answer back to kind of what you said, is that, yes, uh, they, there was this debate in Germany, and this is something that she personally struggled with, the story that you heard. But at the end of the day, one of the tenants is lowering a defense budget. So I would, I would go ahead and counter and say that at some point over the long run, when you're lowering defense budgets, how do you end up supplying weapons to countries like Ukraine who are in critical need of them when you're lowering defense budgets for your own country? I think that becomes a real issue. And in the United States right now, it is already a huge issue that we're spending 7% of our defense budget to help Ukraine. But thank goodness we have a huge defense budget in the United States. So I think while we say these things, I think it's really important to understand what, what the long-term implications are of some of these tenants. And, and that is one of them. Please. Um, yeah, just jumping in on nuances and contextual differences of where we work. You know, even the word gender itself can be um, quite aggravating in one context and not in another. So it's really understanding the context that you work in and being as inclusive of as many people and voices as possible to develop these frameworks. Um, but I think in terms of long-term approaches, I mean, conflict prevention is cheaper than conflict, than war, right? Spending money on addressing root causes or drivers of conflict is cheaper than a more militarized hard security approach. And on Christina's point, I'm not saying you can't defend yourself, your country, but also in parallel, taking that long-term approach to addressing root causes, and that could be um, inequalities related to political participation, economic inequality, gender inequality. But if we don't take that approach, we're just continually going to be addressing the symptoms of conflict and not necessarily their root causes. So I think that's really key to keep that in mind. It's not one answer fits all. You can take a comprehensive approach to this. So we have two more questions in the audience. I'm going to take them together. I think someone over here and someone over here? Yes. Go ahead. Uh, thank you for bringing up points uh, to the forum today. And uh, I've been working on uh, social protection and gender policies for the past eight, eight and a half years in Asia and some parts in Africa. And I've had some close observations, and I just thought I should bring them here on the table. Keep it short, though. We've yes, got one yes, minute. Yes. Quickly. So for, in India, for example, uh, I've observed that even though we have very strong policies, uh, policies are available that women need to get crash or, for example, uh, policies that will keep them at work because most women move out of the formal economy after they get pregnant, af after they have to provide a childcare system. So those are the challenges that, despite policies being there, we see that there's no implementation that's happening on the ground. Like most organizations do not have crashes available. If I talk about agriculture, most farmers, Despite women working on ground, most farmers are considered to be men. Is there a question you can pose to the panel? Yes, so I want to understand what do you think, uh, and just some point that you brought on L LGBTQ, I also want to highlight that, that uh, most of the policies by design exclude this segment. So I want to understand, as you coming from developed countries, how do you think some of these challenges can be resolved and, main, and brought in mainstream, and, or, or maybe mainstreamed for the developing countries so that such um, th things can be taken care of and more uh, are in the highlight. Thank you. Can I take the second question, Something, someone over here? Going back, Terry, to one of the insights from your opening on the composition of peace talks. I would love to get reflections from Her Excellency, from Peter, from anyone on the panel on who gets to be at the table. Now we're, we see it time and time again, straight lineups of men around the table to negotiate a peace deal. We're seeing it now in the South Caucasus. It doesn't help. And it's probably the least likely formula for a breakthrough. So who gets to sit at the table? How does that change? I know you've all thought about it in different contexts. So we are basically out of time, but I do want to give each of you. Terry, there's one more question there. Oh, sorry, I can't really see you. Please. I know, I know. So there's one question to your right and one question here to your left. Okay. okay. Great. And then we'll go back to the panel. All right, let's start over here. Thanks, Samir. 
So uh, basically my question is quite related to actually what she was saying. Uh, Your Excellency, you mentioned that actually the definition of the word feminist is not the same everywhere. And that's actually particularly true in the global south. If you just label something feminist, you'll see a lot of people actually getting irritated at the second, literally. And this is why sometimes I really call myself woman advocate, rather than you know getting sometimes labels that people would not unite around, but actually even you cause more, I would say, division into that. So my question here is basically, as you are, I would say, exploring right the word of feminist uh, foreign policy and what can we do better, are we making sure that? those basically females who are like you know in the global south and in those rural areas are also getting their own definition of their for of their feminist foreign policy are they getting their own definition of actually feminism and how it should be done globally so that's basically my question how can we do better of this as well that's a great question so Samir, final, to you. A quick question uh, i'm sorry uh, i have to butt in i wanted to ask this look good ideas of, whose time has come will prevail let's be honest here and we can we can protest, we can resist, but eventually it's going to prevail. Now, and most trends, uh, most uh, ideas that prevail have uh, early momentum, have a pushback, as uh, you were mentioning, uh, Your Excellency, and then have a renewed upsurge. Do you think we are at that point, that we are seeing a bit of a pushback because the idea is now going to prevail? Do you, and if we have to cross the valley of death, which sometimes uh, ends some of the initiatives, what can others do? Uh, what can men do? What can traditional institutions do? What can think tanks do? What can, what can communities do to ensure that we get it out of this, this valley that all good ideas have to, in some sense, experience before they become mainstream? And I think that's the challenge. How do you take a boutique idea and make it global, make it mainstream, make it local, make it uh, from an elite conversation to a street conversation? Thank you. We're going to go one minute each to respond to any of the questions that you prefer. So, Excellency, can I start with you? Yes, and there have been quite a few questions that refer to Excellency, so I guess that was me. Um, <laughs> let, me talk about, let me talk about peace and women. From the 90s, from 1990, 585 peace agreements have been signed. Out of those, 19 make a reference to women. And out of those 19, only seven are binding. It's not wishful thinking, it's binding. This means that women are missing in peace processes. They're missing at the table. We saw that in Afghanistan. We saw the meetings in, in, in Qatar, where the Taliban were meeting with the Americans and there were no women to be seen there. That is the problem. Women are missing at the key tables. You know, we saw the table last year when the, the Black Sea Grain Agreement was signed between Russia and, 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 and Ukraine with Turkey being there and the UN. Incredible, square table, large table, not a single woman sitting there. So this is at the heart, and, and Samir, let me go to your point. This is what is happening. There is, there is resolution 1325, good definitions there. There is lack of will to implement, to fully implement, and to put the resources into that implementation. You know, when you look at the figures, and they were referred earlier, of the level of militarization and investment in militarization that we face today, a tiny piece of that will make a huge difference in implementing this type of peace agreements and recognition of women participation is nowhere there. So my view is that we are not at a, at a point where this is just a little blip in the road that we are moving forward. I think we have a serious pushback and we need to come together, men and women of goodwill that see the world as men and women participated as equal partners. That's the only thing that will make a difference. And that requires academic thinking, requires civil society, requires governments that are convinced about this, and requires this to become a serious matter that will really make a difference to the world. Peter, 30 seconds to a minute. Last thoughts, answers to any of these 
Great questions. Yeah, uh, maybe uh, where Susanna finished, uh, I also have some data here prepared by women. Um, according to the UN uh, Women's Global Study of Implementation of uh, 1325, which I was also negotiating, by the way, women constituted only 2% of mediators, 8% of negotiators, and 5% of witnesses and signatories of major peace processes. Um, equally, which is more interesting, the chance that a peace agreement will hold for longer than two years is 20% higher if women are involved in peace talks, and the chance that there will be still peace after 15 years is as much as 35% higher. Is the, if the women are involved. And you know, statistics can be misleading and we can all interpret it uh, as we want. And, but these are data from trusted UN agencies. And for me, it's unbelievable that we don't trust them, you know, or that we don't act upon them. If you know that bringing women to the table will increase chances that the peace will hold, why don't we do it, you know? And this comes to the question of Samir, where basically uh, he said that uh, you know we need to push um, for these uh, policies or for these concepts to become mainstream in the international relations. I would say uh, we don't have any other option. I mean, what is the alternative? If you look at Samir, how the world is right now, and we have been together at many, many conferences, it's not like that we are living in the best of possible worlds. So if we are not, it seems that we are doing something wrong. So we must introduce things as solidarity, as sustainability, as uh, social inclusion, as gender equality, if we de basically want to leave the world in conundrum, which we have right now, and go to the world of uh, sustainability, which uh, needs to be something that uh, our huge future holds for us. Because if it doesn't, the other option, I don't want to talk about it. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Elizabeth, to you. Last thoughts. Um, um, I think just Samir's point is this the pushback before you know we succeed. And yeah, I think I'm gonna take an optimistic view on this because even though we are seeing rollbacks, uh, cuts and budgeting for working on um, women's rights and gender rights, the, the work continues despite the challenges. You know, the local women's organizations are carry on daily, with limited funding and is continuing and you can see it being transferred to the next generation as well. So maybe I'm taking an overly optimistic view on this, but I definitely think this this is the push and eventually we, we will end up there. Lara, to you, last thoughts? Um, I, I wanna talk a little bit about peace and security quickly. One minute. Very quickly. Um, think about prioritizing peace over security. If Israel had done that, would Israel exist today? Just a question to pose from a Jewish girl on the panel. Um, peace without security isn't peace, something to think about. Um, you can't rush peace at any cost, and, um, and you really have to put in place security concerns. At the end of World War I, the Treaty of Versailles was signed, but it didn't take into consideration German rearmament, which eventually, in 1939, uh, Germany started uh, taking over a large part um, of Europe, leading to large genocide of the Jewish people. So these things can spiral fast and they can be dangerous. So I would, again, bring back up peace without security is in peace. My last point. Thank you for that. Christina, final thoughts, please. If we look at the world today, um, the root cause of the climate destruction, um, economic inequality, um, violence against women, um, conflicts like the, the, the huge problems, the, the root cause is patriarchy. Um, so the only way um, to create a world that is in a better state can be through like feminist movements and feminist thinking. And feminist foreign policy ultimately is in alignment with what I think Albert Einstein once said, that we cannot um, solve problems with the very mindset that created them. But as a society, we keep doing that all the time. Um, and very last point, um, um, there are so many countries in this room at this conference, um, 70 countries, many government officials, please do come over if you're interested in the con concept. My organization has lots of material. Um, my book, The Future of Foreign Policy is Feminist, will come out in English this September. If you're government official interested in the topic, we'll make sure it will be sent to you. Um, and we're very 
very happy to support any government implementing a feminist foreign policy. Thank you for that. Please join me in thanking our amazing panel. <laughs> Thank you. you know, as, as we close, let me offer you some reading material. We have uh, a scholar here, Vidisha Mishra. She wrote for ORF on this subject. Uh, Terry wrote as well. And uh, uh, we have produced a series of papers. Um, and um, uh, one of the things we must read about and think about even as we try to make foreign policy more inclusive, more representative, more fair, uh, we should think about something else that is happening on the side that might be moving faster than this effort. It's emerging tech and AI especially. And if AI prevails in its current state, patriarchy wins forever. It is going to encode militarization. It is going to include, uh, encode civility. You have the, uh, so you know, I, I was reading something. The Japanese uh, and the East Asian industries spent $36 billion in creating the perfect sex companion. And the, and the advertisement says, she wishes you happy birthday, she blinks her eyelids, uh, she will quote you Shakespeare and she will never say no. We have worked 4,000 years to not make this statement. And the, the sales pitch of an uh, intelligent companion is now this. So when a 15-year-old goes to the market to look for the perfect companion, these are the attributes that the 15-year-old is going to seek. And guess what? This is one challenge, right? The second challenge, where is the largest investment happening in AI? We are all celebrating chat GPT, but where is the largest investment happening in AI? In killing machines to kill the perfect killing machine. And if, and if masculinity is embedded in, in, in uh, innovations that will eventually become commercial, the basis would be exactly that, a militarized, class-based, patriarchal system that will treat some people more equal than others. Food for thought, thank you for joining us this evening. Join me in congratulating the wonderful women. And I want one more day of your life. Have fun. Thank you. <laughs>